name is Rebecca Thompson. I'm a doctoral student in the Department of Psychology and Social Behavior um, and also one of the organizers of this series. And so on behalf of the Office of the Chancellor and the Campus Climate Council, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to What Matters to Me and Why. Uh, we're now in our fourth season and we're very excited to have yet another exciting speaker come to share with all of us today, uh, Saeed Shoker from the uh, Europe program. And uh, you'll hear a bit more about him in a second, but I just wanted to uh, uh, tell you all a little bit about this series for those of you who may not uh, have had the chance to come to one of these talks before. Um, so this is a fairly unique series. It's non-academic, um, which it's one of the few opportunities we get on this campus to like hear from people about uh, uh, more than just their academic lives. and uh, We get to hear about their uh, values, beliefs, and motivations, including how all of these are shaped by their personal journeys, including both highs and lows. Um, and so we hope you all will uh, gain inspiration from uh, hearing these stories, and, and then this will enable all of us to uh, strengthen bonds with uh, people we may not get to interact with very often on campus, as well as celebrate both uh, diversity and uh, things that bind us together um, on this campus. Um, and this will also give you a chance to ask some questions as well um, after the talk. So just a few details before we begin. Um, we want to be good stewards to our hosts and humanities, so please don't forget to uh, throw away your lunch after you're finished. Um, also, this talk will be videotaped. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's all the other talks have also been videotaped and they're available on our website if you would like to take a look at some of the ones you may have missed. Um, but also, if you're sitting towards the front, there's a possibility that you might uh, be captured on the video. And so if that's not something that you're interested in, you may want to move to the back. Um, also, we have, each of you should have received a questionnaire whenever you uh, arrived, and we do take uh, all of your feedback into account um, following these talks, so if you could please fill that out and turn it in before you leave. Um, and then also, please uh, mark your calendars for our next uh, and last speaker of the 2015-16 series, which will be um, on May 11th. We have Greg Washington from uh, the Department of Engineering. So. Uh, please mark your calendars for that. Be on the lookout for the uh, sign up for for that. They usually, uh, I mean, you all know because you're here, but the uh, sign ups usually go pretty quickly. So please be sure to be on the lookout for that. Okay. Um, and as is our tradition, uh, this series brings together people from across campus who may not know each other, including students, faculty, and staff from across all departments on campus. So if you would all like to take uh, just a moment to say hello to someone who you may not have met um, sitting around you, and then we'll get started. Two minutes are up. <laughs> Actually, we, we really encourage you getting to know each other and, and talking like this. So <clears throat> I applaud you for doing it. So good afternoon and uh, welcome back to another action-packed, fun-filled, exciting What Matters to Me and Why. My name is John Stupar. And I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Saeed Shilker. It's truly an honor for me to uh, introduce Sha Saeed. Uh, we've been old friends for a long time, <laughs> actually uh, dating back to the 1990s, uh, when we worked together with Dr. Roland Schinzinger, uh, whom some of you may fondly remember. Uh, we developed some summer courses in energy and the environment, 
which uh, eventually led to my being hired uh, to teach in the School of Engineering, and Saeed to move on to become the founding director of UROP. For those of you who don't know, UROP is the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program here at UCI. Saeed's passion and commitment to this undergraduate research has been described as entrepreneurial and nothing less than fantastic. And I, I really uh, ad, you know, admit that 100% Saeed, you've done a fantastic job. He's involved and earned the support and respect of many individuals both on and off campus, including faculty, students, administrators. For those of you who don't know, UROP encourages and facilitates faculty-mentored research and creative activities by undergraduates from all schools and all academic disciplines here at UCI. Said also serves on the Institutional Review Board, called the IRB, and the Responsible Conduct of Research Task Force and the Academic Senate Council on Student Experiences. In 2006, he received the Individual Louds and Laurels Award for Exceptional Staff Performance. He's a member of the following honor societies, Pi Beta Kappa, Tau Beta Pi, the Engineering Honor Society, uh, Eta Kappa Nu, the Electrical Engineering Society, and he's also a member of the Board of Governors. Outside of UCI, Said has served on the following boards the National Conference on Undergraduate Research, the Southern California Conferences for Undergraduate Research, the National Conference on Undergraduate Research, and as well as being a member of the fellows and the consulting committees on those boards. And recently, Said was asked to chair the task force for internationalizing undergraduate research, which is phenomenal worldwide. Said has administered programs funded by various federal agencies such as the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, U.S. Department of Energy, NASA, and the list goes on and on. Uh, most importantly though, Said is an honored husband and a proud father of three, one having arrived just in January. So, Saeed's middle name should be Research, and he's going to come up and tell us what matters to him and why. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I don't know, when I was listening to him, is that me? And, um, My name is Saeed, which means happy in Arabic. So I am Saeed to be with you. <laughs> show care because it has always been a goal of mine to show care to everybody around me. <laughs> you like that, Jim? <laughs> I'm honored and humbled by your presence. I'm influenced by the environments that I've touched and I've been part of since I was born. So therefore, my values of who I am are shaped by you and the way you have impacted my life since I've, been at, I've arrived at UCI back in 1985. So the credit goes to you. And if you notice any flaws of my character, that's because of my fault. And you have nothing to do with it. <laughs> I believe we're measured by our deeds and reputation. And that's what we really take with us at the end of this journey. Allow me to share with you some of my journey and I would like to open it at the end to invite your questions and for you to comment on some values that you have recognized in me that I might have missed. So we'll do an open mic at the end for whoever wants to. As long as we don't make it sound like a, a memorial <laughs> or that I'm about to leave the university. 
unless some people wish that. I come from, I was born in the, what I would consider the beautiful mosaic of the country of Syria. That's before the, uh, the war and the Syrians have destroyed it. I am, I've lived the first 17 years of my life in Damascus, but I'm originally from the southern part of Syria called, a uh, province called Sueda. And it's primarily a Druze community. Don't ask me about the religion because I, was, I wasn't allowed to touch the religious books. They felt I was too young. Even though my li life has taught me that there isn't really much difference between religions, they're all promoting the same. And it's unfortunate sometimes how things get politicized. The Druze community is a proud community and it's known for its generosity and courage. In fact, it led the uh, revolution against the French back in the early 19th uh, century. And I'm from this specific town called Kreia, which is about my, our house, my grandparents' house is about 50 meters away from uh, the gentleman who led that revolution. His name is Sultan Bashar Atrash. I skipped the first grade, not because I was a troublemaker, but because they felt I can go on to the second grade. My dad is, um, was a legal advisor for the Syrian oil company and that's nothing compared to other oil companies in the region, just to put things in perspective. My mom was an elementary school teacher for 28 years. My dad is the statesman, the sensitive. He wants to make sure everybody is happy. My mom was the disciplined, <coughs> driven, who wants to sacrifice herself to make sure everybody is happy and comfortable around her. I remember in the third grade getting on a math quiz seven out of 10 and my mom made me feel a little bit guilty about that and I cried. After that I decided I'm gonna depend on myself and in a way uh, she didn't really uh, need to spend too much time with me, helping me or, or tutoring me and, and so forth. I'm the older child. I have a brother and a sister. A brother who's three years younger and a sister who's 13 years younger. Ever since I was a kid, I don't remember having a free summer. There was always a lot of pressure on, Saeed is gonna be this, Saeed is gonna help with this. I remember helping with cleaning, with the grocery shopping, and don't tell my sister, who's 13 years younger, I also change her diapers. <laughs> I tease her every once in a while. At, in Syria, at the end of the 12th grade, they give you a, a test in every subject, and based on your combined uh, total numerical score, it dictates what subject you can pursue at the university. And if you score very high, then you're eligible to pursue medical school. Luckily, I did, per, I did score very high across the country, and I was admitted into medical school. And there is a six-year program after high school. However, I have an uncle who's a pediatric cardiologist at UCLA, and he convinced me to come here because eventually he said, you will come and do your residency. So I got on that KLM flight, and I arrived on January 29, 1984. And it has been a wonderful, and a challenging journey since then. The fact that I come from a middle class and, and I was thinking, and, and I'm coming to this environment as a foreign student, not as a net payer, okay? But as a student who came from an international environment because I wanted to enrich this environment and I also want to be enriched by this environment. And at the time, the, gov the, the government would allow my parents to exchange a dollar for four liras. So I remember I started the journey doing, you know, I, when I started here at UCI, I was a food server, and then I became an assistant manager. Then, don't tell anybody, then they put me as a bartender. 
<laughs> even though I wasn't of age. That was in the back in the back lot Bogart. I know Ramin probably remembers that when, when we had less gray hair. And I was admitted initially as a biological sciences major, but then I thought, you know, I really like the math and the physics and so forth, so I doubled major with electrical engineering. But just to give you the, when I arrived, I still remember at LAX, uh, my English was so limited. There they teach you some grammar and that's about it. I remember uh, back then the building where the luggage was separate from where the terminal and there was a picture with an arrow under it, picture of the luggage. And so I picked up that picture, I went to an officer and I said, you know, where is this? Where can I pick up my, I didn't say, I didn't say where can I pick up my luggage. It was all sign language. He looked at me and was like, hmm, how did you get here? <laughs> I remember submitting uh, an application to the uh, INS, for those who remember the uh, Immigration Nationalization Services, and I said, please give me permission to allow me to work. They sent me a letter, they said, you have 30 days to leave the country. <laughs> and that was before I even started UCI, and you can imagine the panic, and you can imagine standing in line at the INS and arriving at four o'clock in the morning to try to talk to somebody to convince them to change their mind. There were so many months that I barely had $50 in my account. <clears throat> but my commitment is, I'm gonna make my parents proud. I'm gonna make my community proud. I'm gonna be a good role model. In 88, I brought my brother here because he wanted to have the same opportunity as I had. And I was supporting both he and I, and I was working close to 35, 40 hours a week. I'm a lot, only 19 hours on campus, but I was doing the private tutoring and the teaching of the GRE and the MCAT and the GMAT and all this stuff and just to try to supplement. And then I would send some of that money back so my parents would exchange it in the black market and then they benefit from the difference of instead of the four dollar, four liter per dollar, they were exchanging a 12 liter per dollar. I come from a middle class family and that's how I survived. I couldn't afford to have a car when I was an undergrad. But that didn't bother me. I graduated in four years and two quarters, and I thank God that I did it with honors and with integrity. One other thing I want to mention about my background is my paternal grandparents had 14 kids. And you can imagine the gatherings and the celebrations and the hugs and kisses and meals. So I appreciate being part of a group. I appreciate and I wish for every child to experience that kind of environment because it really shapes your character and it shapes who you are. Moving forward, um, then I got hired by the math department as a TA as an undergraduate. I guess they were short on, on, on graduate students. And then I worked as a tutor coordinator, then I worked as a math counselor, and then when I graduated, that's John mentioned earlier um, somebody that I miss dearly, and that's Professor Roland Schinziger. He was a great mentor. He was a co-PI on a grant that we got from the Department of Energy with Fauzi Hermes, who was the assistant dean, who was another great mentor of mine in the Office of Undergraduate Studies at the time. We launched what you call the, at the time, the uh, Energy Scholars Program in support of minority engineering students. And at the time, we were able to use that term, minority, before the Proposition 209. And I do want to acknowledge a student from the first class, Gerardo Gallegos. Can you stand up, please? <laughs> Who went on to graduate in electrical engineering. And, and, uh, and I was very proud of that experience. We developed courses. In the summer, I remember getting you know, 12 to 15 students in a van, and I would drive them myself to different uh, power plants throughout the state of California, renewable, non-renewable. It was such an eye-opening. Um, but I do remember some comments that I would hear from colleagues within the division and say, hmm, he's running a minority engineering program, but he's not 
African American, Hispanic, or American Indian? And my response was, every one of us should be a mentor and expected to be a mentor. And the fact that we did an excellent job with that, and the fact we did not isolate the students, rather we engaged them and that we supported them, that's something, that's a point of pride for me. And, and, and my recommendation to all of us is that we are, and, and as, as I was talking to Doug earlier, as we move and, and we reach the goal of the ultimate diversity and commitment, each one of us should play the role of a mentor to uh, students from diverse backgrounds. And I would encourage all of us to do that. Um, so you're probably wondering, who's this guy? Who, what, what kind of personality? What's this? So when I did the personality assessment, guess who I am? I'm the field marshal. <laughs> okay, and that is less than I guess two percent of the population, one to two percent of the population. What does that mean? I'm the extrovert. I'm the intuitive. I'm the thinker. I'm the judgmental. I'm goal oriented. For those who know me, I like to work in a team. I'm here to be of service in the institution. I'm not here to serve an individual. I am here to serve the institution. I am here to serve faculty and students. And collectively, we should be able to accomplish our goals. My passion sometimes was misinterpreted as aggressiveness. I am not aggressive. In fact, in my engineering training, that's one thing I learned. When I'm viewing a project or when I'm viewing and approaching something, I, I view it as a relationship between entities, not as much between people. And then you add the people dynamic afterwards. I view the, I view the flow chart of things. I identify where bottlenecks are. I feel I'm here to solve problems. I'm not here to maintain things. That's, the, that's what I feel distinguishes a manager and a leader. Um, I believe in collaboration. Europe has a very simple concept behind it. We produce too many robots in education. And I think we all agree on that. Whether it's through the K through 12, or whether sometimes in having students memorize things and getting them stuck on that concept we call a major, or whether focusing them too much on satisfying a de degree requirement. I'm not saying that that's what UCI does. UCI is doing an excellent job in trying to go against that. Students as humans, we have a collective responsibility to help them realize their potential and realize their interests and turn these interests into a passion. And that's an inclusive process, meaning every discipline should be involved and should be at the table, and every just as valuable. Yes, the sciences maybe cost more money, but that doesn't mean they're more valuable. Through Europe, we were also able to cross boundaries where we're doing multidisciplinary programs. And that's something, that's the real life. The real life is multidisciplinary. Every problem we deal with is multidisciplinary in nature. And then we created all kinds of programs. John mentioned some of them. And I was honored to work with many of you, with people who are not in this room, with faculty champions, with academic administrators, with deans. When we started Europe, I want to recognize Professor Jim Danziger, who was the dean at the time. I give him the credit. He supported us. That's when we started that back in fall 1995. And that was when your first year as the Dean of Undergraduate Studies. He kept me on, on my toes, but we had a lot of fun. I love working with you. We have an excellent advisory board. Many of them have, I owe them so much for their wisdom and input. Professor Roxy Silver, I love you. <laughs> Wendy Goldberg, I love you. Many others, Richard Robertson, Don Hoffman, 
When I work with faculty, I present them with options. They know that I'm here to serve. I don't approach them with a tunnel vision and say, here's the only option. I'm going to make the decision for you. When I work with students, they find it refreshing. I don't bog them down. We don't bog them down with a process. We say, what are your interests? Who are you? Right? What can we do to help you? It's all about you taking the initiative. It's all you, about you moving forward and managing the risk and handling the failures that come with the process. And we all know research has a lot of uncertainty about it, and, and failure is an expected outcome. Not in terms of grades. As far as I'm concerned, grades is a game. People have the option, in every class people get A's, B's, C's, and F's, and it's the student's decision, not the professor, as far as I'm concerned, and every student is capable of getting straight A's. But I am devoted to my family. I love my family. But what I'm having difficulty is, because I love my job and because I love what I've been able to do at UCI, is how I'm gonna balance the two. My family now consists of my wife and three children. And to my fellow men in this room, I say, there is a better gender out there, and that is women. <laughs> Can we give women a hand, please? <laughs> Seeing what she has gone through, okay? Not only putting up with me, but the whole pregnancy, delivery, raising the kids, et cetera, et cetera, and the lack of sleep. Mothers walk on water. In fact, there's a saying in Arabic that I'm going to translate, heaven is under mother's feet. All mothers are destined to go to heaven. I brought my parents and sister back in 91 also to the US, and my parents have been living with us since then. I would never put them in a nursing home. That's a point of pride. My sister went to, she came here in seventh grade, and I love her. And she went to UCI, actually. She did her undergraduate here, and she graduated summa cum laude. With my children, this morning I dropped my, <coughs> my daughter off at school. She's a five-year-old. And as, as the teacher was holding her hand and they're walking away, she looked at me and she goes, I love you, Papa. To me, that's what life is about. And that's what I need to remind myself. Nothing is worth stressing out about. But the fact that I've taken on so much in terms of family responsibility, the parents, the children, and we have in-laws living with us, and I'm bringing my, more of my relatives out of the troubled environment in Syria now. So anytime there's a challenge, guess who's the problem solver? Said. Anytime there's somebody in the hospital, who's spending the night with them? Said. But I love it, and I'm proud to do that. But does it add a, another stress, a level of, am I making the right decision? Everybody is looking up to me. I pray that I am, and I thank God for the strength that, he, that she has given me <laughs> over so, long, so many years. I am strategic in my thinking, I'm not tactical. I believe in honesty. In fact, last week I did ask uh, members of the, this is something I also want to acknowledge, not only the, all the people that I've already said, but also members of the Europe team, and I know they're here today. And I did ask them, Philippe, Daniela, Jerry, and I asked them, I said, what do you, what do you characterize as some of my values? And, and I, I mentioned many of them to you already, but they also added, <coughs> Uh, 
the team oriented, the integrity, the, the honesty, um, paying attention to details. That might drive them crazy. <laughs> but at the end, it's all about the end goal. There's nothing personal about it. We're all here to serve and we're expected to do it with the highest quality possible. Serving on national boards has really made me realize, yes, this is, and I've never viewed it as, what is good for me? I've always viewed it as, what's good for UCI? I'm representative, I'm an ambassador of UCI. And when I'm sitting around the table of deans and different titles and whatever, by the way, as far as I'm concerned, what really differentiates us is not titles and degrees and salaries. It's how we make our decisions. That's something that I've learned. Another thing that I've learned from my mentors, and that's a bit of the hard truth, where the truth really doesn't matter, but rather how things are perceived. But serving on these boards gave me another sense of pride and confidence in who I am and what we can do. 70% of what I've done, nobody asked me to do. Let's be honest about this. I saw the potential, we worked with the right people, we did it, okay? And think of it entrepreneurial, think of it as, and maybe I'm blessed with some ability, but I'm not unique. That I'm able to anticipate 20 steps ahead, I'm able, when we launch things, we do it right from the get-go, perhaps. Um, I just want to be appreciated. I, mean, I don't ask for much. I just want somebody to say, good job. I've never been a resume builder. I'm going to share with you a story 16 years ago. Out of nowhere, a university in Southern California approached me through somebody who knew me and said, you know, come and visit with us. I said, okay, fine. So how do we do this, how do we do that? Yeah, here's some suggestions, here's this, here's that. Oh, we want you to come work with us. I said, I'm very happy where I am. No, 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 please just, I said, I'm really happy where I am, I don't need the, fine, send me an offer. Or, or let us send you a letter. I didn't say the offer. In the letter, here's what we're offering you, here's the salary, here's this, here's that. I looked at it and I'm like, at the time, that was 14,000 more than what I was making. I went to my dean at the time, the assistant dean, and keep in mind, prior to that, we would almost have holes in our pants begging for the be reclass and, and so forth and so on. And they said, don't worry about it. And there's a mentor that I've never mentioned his name, but I do want to mention right now, that he gave me a call at the time, and that was the president of the Academy of Sciences, former chancellor, Rob Cicerone. And he called Saeed, we still have more work to do on undergraduate research. And he had to approve that salary increase, which was more than 25% of what I was making at the time. For those of you who have interacted with Ralph, I've never, I didn't work closely with him, but, I, but you can tell from when you see him approaching, he's almost like reading your mind. And he engages you in a way, he was able to touch different people at different layers, and he was able to make you feel like you're valuable. To me, that means a lot. It's not about the money. Now, of course, since then, I keep getting these invitations, but I keep declining them. I'm not going, <laughs> I'm happy here, you know. Um, I appreciate competent people, and we all have our own definitions of what we consider competent or incompetent or, you know. I appreciate also co honest conversations where we can help people uh, become uh, more competent. The fact that I'm a giver, I like to give before taking. I don't like working with selfish people. 
I just don't. Um, this is a commitment that I want to make to all of you, is let's continue to work together with those who have joined us as new employees or recent employees. We still have a long journey ahead to take UCI to being number one. Long in the sense, we might accomplish it very soon, but I don't mean long in the sense that many years, but I mean long in the sense that we still have to get more people around the table and to have these conversations and, and to really get more into implementing the strategic goals that we have put in place. I thank you for the opportunity to be with you, and I look forward to, again, hearing your comments and your questions. Thank you. So basically, I'm inviting you to comment either on values that I might have missed <laughs> or questions you would like to pose. This is a community, right? Hi, my name is Jackie, and I am an undergraduate in TSB, a senior graduating this year. And I came here as a first-generation college student. I didn't know what research was. I didn't even know what an empirical article was. And Sayu came and spoke into the 2013 summer course I was taking. And I immediately was excited, and I said, I need to do that. I don't know what it is, but I need to do that. And I called his office and made an appointment the very next day. And I expected to come in and have a very, you know, I wasn't sure if I was dressed right. I was really nervous. And instead, for those of you who haven't been in his office, there's a little table, a couple chairs, and he's sitting there casually. He says, you want a piece of candy? And, and I like, oh, oh, no, thank you. And, and still very uptight I was. That's, that, that's how I maintain my shape. <laughs> but I just want to thank you because you changed my perspective oh. and you've made me a researcher. He asked about me and what I was interested in and what excited me. And I walked away and I remember calling a few people going, I don't know what just happened, because it wasn't what I expected, but it was so much more than I could have asked for. So thank you. Can I give her a hug? Thank you. Normally I avoid human co uh, contact with students, but <laughs> Rachel, be quiet. Thank you. I'll give you a hug later. <laughs> so I also see myself as being more of a giver than a taker. But something I've struggled with is that there is always far more people asking for things than you can ever meet. So do you have a strategy for what you do, what responsibilities you accept and which ones you turn down? Can you pass the mic to my, <laughs> to, to, to my assistant, Dan Daniela? I think she would like to address that. Never said no to anybody. <laughs> so I think that the way that 
if I have the energy and the time, I will be cheating you and the institution if we don't do it. Honestly. But also keep in mind that I don't believe in a dependency situation. So when you're asking for things, I also want you to take ownership of whatever it is so we can work together. That's why I never believed in matching students to faculty. I never believe in telling students what to do. Thank you. I like this passing the mic idea. You like that? <laughs> yes. Oh, my input? I don't remember. What did I say? <laughs> yeah, just give, repeat it in the microphone. Oh, okay. So his question was, um, he's a giver. When do you know when to stop, right? And I decided the best way to address it is to refer him to my assistant, right? Who you heard her, what she said. My comment was, as long as I have the energy and the time, I would be cheating the individual and the institution if I don't address that. But at the same time, I believe in a shared responsibility. That is, I don't believe in a dependency situation. I'm not the solver of every problem. I don't want somebody to approach me about every, you know, we, so if I'm enabling him, my job is to enable him to make his own decisions and to make, to maybe attempt to address <coughs> the challenge that he's having on his own. But if I'm able to solve it, then it's my job to, uh, you know, solve it. But I don't want him to be weaker and dependent on me, right? The same thing, for example, with when we approach IT, because I know you, you appreciate that. Um, I don't believe in developing a button for somebody to create multiple steps, right? I want people to appreciate, for example, how a query in a database is designed, and they appreciate the logic of it. So on and on and on, right? Before I came to the US, I never knew what a calculator was. Everything was done by hand. Calculus was done by hand. So if somebody doesn't know how to do things by hand, how can they detect a problem in a calculator when they're doing rotation around x equals, right, Rachel? See what I'm saying? So, um, you want to say now? Yeah. So, um, my name is Parshant. I'm a graduating senior, and I've known Said since my second year. And uh, one thing too, I really want to highlight is, you know, in the last four years, every day, really, there's a lot of stressors. There's a lot of things that you know I have to go through, and as a student, and this year as a senior leader, especially, there's a lot of times where I go into try to do things and talk with folks, and there's always obstacles. The first thing that I meet with people and I ask them something like, hey, I want to do this. The first thing I get back as a response is, well, you have this in front of you, this in front of you. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. And the one person in my three years now that I've known who was always open to the, any idea was Saeed. And I, I remember every time I would go to his office and I'd be like, Saeed, I have this in mind. The first response wasn't, oh, well, you can't do that, or you can't do this. The first response was, that's a great idea. Let's see how we can do this. And, and that's really something I appreciate. And also, I mean, a question. I don't know how you do it, Saeed. So how do you do this? How, how are you able to maintain that energy and positive energy for everybody that comes knocking on your door? Hmm. <laughs> I guess because, uh, can I give you a hug? <laughs> <laughs> Just so you don't think I'm gender biased. Uh, right, Jim? Um, how do I do it? I think, I truly believe in, these, in, in the values that I described. And I'm not a bureaucrat. I hate bureaucracy. I'm a facilitator. I'm here to work with you to solve problems, right? And if we have the capacity to envision what might a solution be, then let's do it. 
There are days where I'm feeling a little bit tired, but I get energized when I'm engaging people. You bring the energy. You, I mean, this environment brings the energy uh, to me. Right, Gerardo? Gerardo? Oh. Thank you so much, Mr. Selin. My name is Lydia Natolo. I'm a third year student, bio major, running for office. <laughs> um, I'm just so honored and humbled to be here. I would echo everyone, and Pajun is just an amazing other student fellow who has helped me in my campaign. But I'm here to appreciate you, Mr. Sayed, for your gentleness, your gracious art you have. The first time I heard him present was last quarter. He came to our class and he literally caught our hearts and told us, you're not here just to show up in class, but there's so many other events on this campus that will enrich your journey. And that's why I'm here today. The next thing is because of his research initiative here at UCI, I'm a transfer student from Santa Barbara College, where I wrote a research paper about water coming from Uganda. Every hour, 38 children are dying because they're drinking contaminated water. And they used to drink that water. And that's the book I wrote, in which I received an exemplary achievement of one because of his initiative, his journey. And because of that, there's a story of a hospital in Uganda, among many, that was operating without water. And the only water source was contaminated, which I traveled to last year. And I'm sharing all this to come back to last week when I went to meet Mr. Saeed in his office. And then he helped me to make that appointment. That today, there's a new water system. And for the last six months, this water system has been in this hospital. We've cut down mortality rate by 28%. If it was not for the opportunity for me to present my work, to come here to UCI as a Saddleback student, and again to be a UCI student, and when I came here, I reached out to his office and I said, I need to do more research with the water issue, not just in Uganda, but in the rest of the world. And I think Flint situation has opened the reality. But I had about five questions in his office last week. He gave me a hundred answers. And I'll say, thank you so much, sir, for your humble heart. I appreciate you. I am honored that you were here, or you are here. I really want to emphasize the credit goes to her and the faculty she's working with. What we're doing is simply facilitating and engaging in conversations. That's all we're doing. The credit, again, I emphasize, goes to the faculty and students. And in the undergraduate research enterprise, we have to do whatever we can to continue to recognize faculty. We're not doing enough. A university will not exist without faculty and students. And the collaboration that they have done, and let's face it, I mean, when we talk about the missions of the University of California, the education, research, public service, what's a beautiful way to integrate research and education? And I'm against the polarity that sometimes I sense between teaching and mentoring. A good mentor is a good teacher. We should not create that polarity. Yes, good teachers are not recognized enough, and I agree with that. And we need to do whatever we can. And I believe the campus leadership, Vice Provost Diana Dowd and Judy Stepanaris, are doing everything they can and others on campus to address these issues. But for those who work closely with the faculty, here's another observation that I have, if you would allow me. One layer on this campus that's missing <coughs> is more people who integrate layers. In the sense that we have, for example, research development, fundraiser, this and that. But we need to help the faculty by reducing the burden on them with the administrative step and then taking some of these ideas and working with them and then cutting across layers by taking it all the way from a concept to implementation. That's, I think, how we can thrive more. But that's my humble opinion. But I love your spirit, and I thank you for being here. Another value that I have, and I really want to emphasize, 
is this concept of internationalizing things. I came from a different land and I'm blessed and happy to be here. The opportunities that exist in the U.S. are very unique. It's one of the few countries that opens its borders and hearts and minds to people from other countries. But also many of us, and, and, and let's not forget that, are also contributing. And the brain draw that, that, that has happened where we're drawing so many talents from across the world to come here. But also we should remind ourselves that with this sense of global engagement. That's why under Europe this past year, I started a new program called International Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship. It's not at our expense. The students coming are paying by their sponsors, but this is an opportunity for international students to benefit by engaging you know, our faculty. Yes, I think. One last question. <coughs> Well, you can keep it answering. I'd just like to comment, I think you guys know what kind of person Saeed is. Um, but I think one thing that maybe he didn't mention other people is he takes chances. So uh, my name is Ted Arbo. I was part of the original Energy Scholars. And I like stories because with stories you remember. So he talked about taking a bunch of students that didn't know anything about college, knew nothing about degrees. And imagine, quote unquote, a bunch of minorities in this big white band driven by a Middle Eastern guy going to institutions that make power, create power. And he opened the door for a lot of us, even when the doors were closed to him. We went to one lab, not the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. We had to go through all sorts of paperwork and phone calls and to get in, to allow us. We didn't have credentials or anything. They did not allow Saeed. They did not allow him, but he said, no, you guys need to go. He sacrificed himself to make sure that we were in there looking at things. This is just one little opportunity. So, um, and he always makes things happy. And I remember we'd go in his office and sometimes we'd get in trouble and he said, are, are you serious? No, man, I'm Syrian. That's the joke. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you still say that. Ladies and gentlemen, a big thank you, Mr. Sarah. You're awesome. Can I go up? I am, a, I am a U.S. citizen now. <laughs> I came on an F-1 visa, and then the university sponsored me for an H-1B visa. And as many of you know, the H-1B can be renewed only for a second term. My uncle applied for my mom to get her green card back in 81. And, it, and at the time, it used to take six months to a year. It took her 11 years to get her green card. I refused to get the green card through other means. Rather, I wanted for her to get her green card, so eventually I get it. I remember back in 97, I had three months left on my H-1B. And that's after the second renewal, which means if that expired, I had no other means of staying in the US. Rather, I had to leave. I went to the INS and I begged this officer. I said, look, my case is current. What can we do? I'm supporting a family, please. And bless his heart, he moved my case forward and I got my green card. And five and a half years later, I'm a proud US citizen. Thank you very much, Saeed.